turbocharged 51 over here. I hope you're having a splendid day wherever you are in the world. And once again, it's that time of the week. It's time for the podcast. Uh, this time about the the past French Grand Prix. And once again, finally, today I'm not doing the podcast alone. I've got Johnny with me today who's looking very nervous here alongside me. Um, but he's also in a very jokey mood. So Johnny, how are you today? Hello. Good. <laughs> very good. Guys, Johnny actually added a few very interesting talking points for us today. Um, so let's kick off because we've got a lot to run through. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's your fault, by the way. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. First talking point is the immense tire degradation when it was race day on Sunday. And we'll talk later on about what an absolute horrendous race Ferrari had due to the tire degradation. It caught them out completely. But... Basically, we want to talk about what caused the high tire degradation. And um, I'm actually glad this is one of Johnny's points. For someone being a new F1 fan, he really goes into detail with things. But um, the first thing we want to talk about is earlier that morning, when obviously some of the FITA series is raced, and the one FITA series that raced was Formula 3, and it was a wet race. Now, what happens as soon as it rains, all the rubber that, the, that all the races, well, all the racing that takes place that weekend, all the rubber the cars lay down on track, as soon as, as soon as it rains, it's basically like it's just washing it away because the rubber basically melts into the tarmac and as soon as it rains it just washes away so basically no grip combined with less rubber on the track it just made the tires basically fall off the cliff within 15 laps i mean even some of the drivers complained about the hard tires within 15 to 20 laps after they put them on we don't even talk about the softs and the mediums were also not a real reliable tire on heavy fuel um so johnny i want to ask you how did you find the the, the tire wear situation for this Sunday? <laughs> Guys, Johnny is so nervous. He's like, I don't know what to say. He doesn't like his voice on podcast. True. I, I think it was a weird thing for me because the track was cooler. So awesome. for me, that it didn't make sense why the tire pulled off the cliff so fast. Um, but because of the rain and all those things I can understand also the wind the wind well uh, Max demonstrate demonstrated very nicely into turn one how the wind was so yeah the wind I think also played a big factor mm. in the tire decorate Dec- De- <laughs> De- that word, De- that word, degradation. Now, guys, basically, there was a gusty wind on Sunday, um, blowing towards the west side of the track. So basically, you turn left into the first corner, and then the cars look west. Um, and like um, Johnny said, Max demonstrated perfectly what a gusty wind can do to the cars. Um, stability heading in towards the um, in towards certain corners but not just the wind the wind is of these three topics was the the, the smallest um, factor in this yes it was colder and when the, the track is colder usually the tires struggle with um, getting up up to temperature and I know a few of the of the lower teams I know Schumacher at a stage complained about struggling to get the tires up to temperature especially the hard that take a while longer than the two other compounds um, and there was a, a few other drivers so I think the fact of rain early that morning with the Formula 3 race as well as the cold track temps and then the small addi- additive of a gusty wind just made tyre management an absolute pain in the butt this weekend especially on Sunday oh yes I, I, yeah. I still don't know how some teams pulled off a one stop to be quite honest because there were still certain drivers I mean like Aston Martin, Stroll and Vettel pulled off a one stop um, I don't know how they did it no idea <laughs> driving on the edge for like 10 laps maybe I don't know yeah probably they just did a lot of tire co- conservation um, but yeah the tire situation this weekend was very interesting and it was a I think it's a good top it, it was a fun topic to talk about um, so yeah moving on towards the next topic of talk is basically me getting actually a prediction correct which I was very really glad about but Ricardo bouncing back like only he can and I know Johnny is a massive Ricardo fan so here comes a rant oh yeah <laughs> I was the was the best thing of the race almost almost just I know what the best thing of the race was for you. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, guys. But Ricardo, my predictions for France was that Ricardo was going to bounce back. But that first stint 
racing with Alonso and the two Ferraris, Ricardo was on fire. He made overtake after overtake, and I mean, even even um, Alonso said on the radio, "Can he slow down that we can at least stay with him?" It was a little bit of a joke, but Ricardo was just—he was on another level in the first stint, and obviously. With McLaren strategies, Lando was quicker in the second stint due to him be having fresher tires. But still, fantastic weekend from Danny Rick. Oh yes, um, yeah, <laughs> just fantastic weekend. <laughs> Johnny is gonna he's gonna warm up eventually. Mm. Last time it took him about five topics to warm up to us, so we'll see what happens, guys. Drop a like down below for, for, for Johnny's confidence when he joins us for a third time. <laughs> yes. Cool. <laughs> okay. Next. Oh, staying with McLaren, guys. McLaren, just overall, if you look at R Danny, Rick, and Lando, the, the McLaren's race pace this weekend was there. I mean, ever since Spain, it was basically Spain. They had good pace in Monaco, but only on Lando's side of the garage. But Spain, Monaco, and then Azerbaijan. This was the first weekend, I think, since Portugal, where both McLarens were properly on pace. Yes. Uh, also, I want to come back to the McLaren. <laughs> the fight between Alonso and Ricardo. The funny thing for me was how quickly Lando caught up to Alonso. It was like he wasn't there in the fight, and then suddenly he just overtook Alonso. I'm just like... How did he do that? <laughs> to be quite honest, that to me was the move of the race when you look at just how cleanly a move can be pulled off and how McLaren, the two McLaren drivers worked together there while basically Lando cap capitalized on Ricardo, giving Alonso a bit of a, of a scruffy time. But Lando basically took some Ricardo inspiration. Johnny, you might not know this, but Ricardo is known as the dive bomb king. And that move that Lando pulled on Alonso was an absolute dive bomb into one of the hardest corners to control the cars on that track. So that was honestly the overtake of the weekend. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> and now actually going in towards talking about Lando, Lando just, he woke up in that second stint. Yes, he had the nice move on, on, on Alonso, but that second stint from, from Norris, there, obviously, he, he schooled Ricardo a bit like he's been doing the entire season so far. But that second stint from Lando, at certain stages, he was lapping as quick as, as the Mercedes cars and well, as well as the Red Bulls until they pitted um, Checo and Verstappen. Yeah, that, that was good. The amount of overtakes he made was just amazing, that second stint. Yeah, and basically, it's it's... I don't know, McLaren just seems certain tracks suit the car perfectly, like Paul Ricard and they go to like the city street circuits like um, Monaco and Azerbaijan and sometimes the pace is just not there. I, I know Lando had a third in Monaco but it's basically because nobody could pass and he did do well to get himself um, up front with qualifying and to keep Perez behind him in the final stint back at Monaco but this weekend the McLaren was basically besides Red Bull and Mercedes the car to beat. Oh yes. Yeah. But, uh... Where did the 7th and 8th end? 7th uh, was Gasly and I think 8th was Vettel in the Aston Martin with their very, very tough one-stop strategy. Alright, back to the results. So actually Gasly was 7th, Alonso was 8th and Vettel was 9th with Stroll in 10th. So the two Astons literally got the final two points. But I mean, if you look at the gap from Gasly... Well, no, wait, actually... All the way to um, to Vettel, there was they were actually quite close. If you look at Norris, he was just more than a minute behind Max at the end, and all the way down to Vettel, it was still under 80 seconds. So from fifth to ninth, they were actually quite close. If you look at how different everybody's strategies were, but that's the talk about McLaren. Now heading in towards the next topic of talk. Uh, okay, one thing that. No, they, they didn't really have a problem this weekend, but it's been a recurring theme this season so far. Mercedes messing up pit stops. And I mean, obviously, Lewis had a longer pit stop because I think it was actually Gasly or Alonso who came into the pit lane with him. So he had to wait so that he wouldn't be released dangerously into the path of, I think it was Alonso. And um, that cost him, obviously, the lead um, for the second stint because Max, um, after the first round of pit stops, was in the lead. So... Yeah, but other than that, Mercedes have really just not been very consistent and good with their pit, stop this, pit stops this season so far. I actually read a statistic um, on, on, on Instagram um, earlier today. Mercedes are the team that has made the most pit stop mistakes this season thus far. Wow. 
Uh, the strategist needs some work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I actually can't blame them because they didn't have any data going into the, the race. Because the practice sessions, data doesn't count anymore because there's no more tire, uh, grip. Uh, no more rubber on the track. So all the data they collected on um, practice and quality is kind of just irrelevant because of the rain. So it maybe made it very much harder for the strategists to get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also true. Um, look, I still think that I don't think that, that all their, their, um, their data was irrelevant, but most of it was not usable due to because the track conditions from Saturday to Sunday, well, from Friday and Saturday towards Sunday was completely different. So there was a lot of data lost. But also, in the same sentence, it was like that for every other team on the grid. So, it's true. so I think Mercedes they don't want to listen to their drivers I mean they could have made a choice on race day like okay alternative strategy because of the tire degradation but I don't know I, I Look, on Lewis's side of the garage, I understand. Um, and obviously, he was the one that had a little bit of a wonky pit stop. Um, but basically, when it comes to the pit stop story, Mercedes just need to sort out their pit stops. Um, Mercedes in the past were known to be, besides Red Bull, they were known to be the pit stop kings. Double stacking Valtteri and Lewis on multiple occasions and just having very clean pit stops. So, the pit crew, I feel, need to be addressed at Mercedes because they are making way too many mistakes this year. But back onto your topic, Johnny, about Mercedes not listening towards their drivers. Uh... <laughs> It was clear that halfway through this, the first, the, uh, the second stint after the first round of pit stops, most of the cars were not going to make it to the end on that set of tires. And basically, Red Bull did exactly what Mercedes did in Spain. Yeah. They, they, they took the punch, pitted Max, and look what happened at the end. Lewis and Valtteri had no tires left. Valtteri couldn't even defend from Perez who didn't have much fresher tires, but also he was, like you said, he was supposed to be a blocker for Lewis when Max came through. He couldn't do anything to keep Max behind him because there was no grip left. Yeah, and um, I, <laughs> the spicy comment towards the garage made it very clear he wasn't happy. Oh no no, Valtteri was mad at the end of the race. Well, after Checo passed, no, after Max passed him, um, he came on the radio and he was extremely mad. Like, why don't you guys listen to me? And also, one thing I want to talk about. Obviously, Mercedes realized that they, what I feel they needed to realize in that moment is, in that moment, the drivers are the ones in the car feeling how the tires are are are, um, are busy losing grip. Why don't they listen to the drivers? Because in that scenario, the drivers know better than, than the strategists sitting in the pit lane. And also, even after Perez passed Bottas, why didn't Mercedes pit Bottas to get the fastest lap? To get take one point away from Red Bull in this very tight Constructors' Championship battle? Because the gap towards the two McLarens was, was basically a minute. Yeah. They had more than enough time, even if they had a crappy pit stop, to still get out ahead and go for fastest lap. Why didn't they put Valtteri in your opinion? I heard something about a penalty, a five second penalty and things like that, but he in any, he in any way ended five seconds behind uh, Checo. So I mean, I don't know, it, they gambled and it didn't work for them. So Mercedes isn't the team we're, we're used to, I think. They're making way more mistakes, maybe because they're under pressure this year. Very true. I actually, <laughs> guys, literally before Johnny came to my house for the podcast, I was busy talking to um, to Craig. You guys know Craig. You've seen him on the channel before. And basically, Mercedes have revealed this year they've got a lot of chinks in their armor. And Red Bull just know when and where to press their buttons so that they they use the weakness in Mercedes' armor. I mean, let's look back. The last time Mercedes were under this type, kind of pressure was back in 2018 when Ferrari was their closest challenge. They ran away with the championship in 2019. Last year, they, they built the fastest racing car in human history with the w, um, W11 Mercedes. And this year, Red Bull just came out of the blocks and said, no, no, no. There has to be something done about this. But I feel Red Bull are putting more pressure on Mercedes than Ferrari did back in 2018. Um... And especially now with Perez finally getting to grips with that Red Bull. And Mercedes, it's as if they don't know what to do in certain situations. And it's in those moments that Red Bull 
it, we've seen it with strategy, we've seen it with pit stops, we've seen it with race maneuvers, that Red Bull just know what to do in that situation when Mercedes go into a panic state, if I can put it that way. Yeah, um, I don't have too much to say, I'm only watching F1 for... A bit more than a year now. A bit more than a year, so I don't have too much to say about that. <laughs> but while we're on the topic of Valtteri Bottas actually being very mad at his team, um, I, and I mean guys, Mercedes apologized to both drivers after the race on the team radio saying, we're sorry, we cost you guys a 1-2 result today. The thing is, at least Mercedes owned up to it, but unfortunately, it's a little too little too late. Yeah. Um, and now, actually the gap between Hamilton and Max is it's kind of big in the drivers. Um, I think it's more than 15 points, if I'm not mistaken. So... Max can basically still be in the lead of the championship come the next two races, even if he finishes second and Lewis wins. So, and, well, we'll see what happens there. And also the constructors specifically, Red Bull have got a little bit of a jump on Mercedes now. So guys, basically moving on, the last topic that we basically um, are going to touch on, but we already talked about it, is basically that Mercedes cost both drivers. We've already mentioned that Mercedes apologized to both Valtteri and Lewis at the end of the race for costing them. But... Just one thing I want to mention before we move on to the next topic, um, which is Red Bull. Mercedes can't make mistakes like this when a team like Red Bull is on the amount of pace and momentum that they are right now. Because it's mistakes like this that can cost you the championship at the end of the year. Championship and constructors. Yeah, okay, yeah both championships. Yeah, both championships. So, yeah. Look, I know that everybody is, well, most Formula 1 fans are tired of the Mercedes and Hamilton dominance. Um, I personally will never ever support Red Bull as a team again after what they did to Kvyat, Gasly and Albon. But, um, so I personally, when it comes to, to the Constructors' Championship, I would hope that Mercedes wins because the only two teams in the, in the championship is Mercedes and Red Bull. But I do want Max to win the drivers um, because I'm also tired of the Lewis dominance. But just because I don't support Red Bull anymore, the, the, the <laughs> I'll go for Mercedes when it comes to the Constructors. Not the point. Heading into the next topic, which is Red Bull. What an absolute master stroke of a plan with both Perez and Verstappen. How did Perez do so many laps on that first set of mediums? He did, I think, almost 15 to 20 laps more than any of the other drivers. Put that onto the hearts and had enough rubber to get to the end and be not as quick as Max, but be legitimately quicker than the Mercedes cars. Well, I have no idea how he did that. Maybe... Well, he could have, he could save that medium tire. So I think the the fact that he could, what's the thing called? His tire management was well. Um, and also, I think if I remember correctly, he was on the team radio back and forth, like, no, tires is fine, and felt all right. So I don't know. Maybe I can bring it in here. The team was listening to the drivers. Exactly. I thought you were going to come to that point. But also, Checo Perez is known as the tr tire preservation king. Ever since he came into Formula 1, back in, I think in 2012 when he raced for Sauber, Perez has been known to be a master at keeping his tires in the right operating window no, ma no matter how bad the wear is. Um, Checo nearly won uh, um, a race in his rookie season for Sauber, which in back in 2012 was not a fast team. Due to having proper tire preservation, he literally came second a few seconds. Of, I think it was like two seconds behind Fernando Alonso in, in that race in Malaysia. It was absolutely insane. And as soon as the race started and the two Mercedes and Verstappen started running away from, from Sergio, the first thing I thought, I'll be I'll be honest, was like, oh, Perez is not on the pace of the, of the front three. What is he doing? Little did we know, he was, from that race start, he was just bridging the gap towards the, the midfield battle with McLaren, Ferrari, Aston Martin, Alpine, just so that, so, so that he's not under pressure and that he's forced to use his tires. He got out of that little battle and just managed his tires until he could get into the pro pro proper pit stop window and actually put pressure on Mercedes come the end of the race. I mean, I don't know if you heard the team radio after Max passed him with Max's second stop, but... Um, Bax um, said that the team should say thanks to Sergio for letting him pass and Perez's immediate ra team radio after that was let's go get them together yeah, I, I that yeah. was insanely cool yeah I, I actually getting goosebumps <laughs> right now because of that so yeah that was a good it just shows you that Formula 1 isn't just a 
specific driver it's a theme sport so yeah that just brings joy to my heart yeah and i mean but red bull did exactly what checo said they got the mercedes yes checo didn't catch lewis but lewis was a fair bit ahead of valtteri after valtteri's tires fell off but max got both of them because he was on fresh tires and checo got bottas with about eight laps to go so he got him with proper time still left so absolute master plan from red bull and um basically the next topic we already mentioned was Verstappen and Red Bull did a Mercedes back in Spain with the whole should we do a one-stop, should we do a two-stop, oh what the hell, screw it, let's go for a two-stop and, and just chase. And I mean, um, Martin Brundle said as soon as Max made his bits up, he's like, Max is going to have to push now. But I mean, you're talking about Max Verstappen, he he rings the hell out of that car every single lap of every session he drives with. It's practice, a test session, qualifying all the race. So... But I'm not going to lie, I had my doubts whether he would catch Lewis. I didn't have my doubts until Lewis, until the pace was similar. Okay, and yeah. then I was like, oh no, please don't let this backfire. But I just want to come back to, to the two-stop. Everyone is talking about the Pirelli tires. And I was wondering if it wasn't in the back of their heads. Is this tire going to last? I think that's a big thing. Look, that clearly Mercedes had the trust in Pirelli to keep the, the drivers out. But even in those final, as soon as Max made his pit stop, I was like, are we going to have a Silverstone 2020 all over again? Um, because the race lost in Silverstone, Carlos signs with McLaren. Um, I think Vettel in the Ferrari, I'm not sure. No, Danny Kvyat in the Alpha Tauri. And Lewis, Lewis finished the race on three tires. He won the race going over the line with a puncture. So, and I was like, oh, we're going to have a Silverstone 2020. Please don't let us have a Silverstone 2020. And by some or other miracle, those tires lasted. But I mean, the cars pulling into park firmer after the race, those tires in the two Mercedes cars were absolutely shot. There wasn't a lot of running left in them. No, I saw that. That was like, oh. So that's how it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was actually absolutely insane. I don't know how Lewis and Max got... Uh, oh, Lewis and Max. Lewis and Valtteri got those cars to the end. But now that you mentioned... Um, actually, Lewis, when the pace got similar... Once again, even though Lewis was in a very tough tough situation... Lewis made his tyres last a lot better than Bottas. And I mean, even when Max was starting to chase... And Max started going through the lapped cars with traffic... Lewis was still able to match Max on certain laps with lap times... And that just shows you that experience and the fact that he's a seven-time world champion means a lot. Yeah. Because a back marker can easily ruin your race. I mean, if you look just at Nikita Mazepin, how many times he's been in trouble this year for not letting drivers pass. One wrong foot from, from for Max overtaking a back marker and the result would have been different. Yeah. So even for that, hats off to Lewis because he really drove. He got the Max out of the race in this, and the situation that he could. Um, that Mercedes put them in so still well done to Hamilton yeah you need to get give credit where credit is due and um, I have never liked him but I'm starting to like him I don't know why it's just something in me is like he's actually a cool dude so yeah he, he did well he did well like I said, to, like, like I said to Craig, um, I've never been a fan of Lewis Hamilton, and I don't think I'll ever be. But I've gained a lot of respect for Hamilton over these, especially these past three years, where Mercedes was dominant, and Lewis was still down to earth. Um, like I will never be like, go Hamilton, go Hamilton, but I will respect Lewis, and when he drives a good race, and he's the driver of the weekend, freaking hell, like you said, give credit where credit is due. Um, and in certain very very bold and crazy crazy situations i might even support lewis but that has to be a real insane situation but i'm no longer i'll admit it i was a total lewis hamilton hater and i'm not that anymore at all lewis is, has really grown up because he had a little bit of an ego when um after rosberg left back in 2016 but lewis is a real nice guy and um he's he, like i said he's grown up a lot and um i've got the world's respect for Lewis Hamilton um, and if he wins the world championship this year he will be the most successful driver in Formula 1 history he's already matched Michael Schumacher with 7 world titles he wins this year he will have his 8th race caught Bottas with was as if Perez was also on a brand new set of mediums like Max I think Perez just went into overdrive yeah that was good to see actually Perez matching 
I, I didn't think he matched Max's pace, but he was matching Max eventually, like the team sport, so that they can, well, just to see two Red Bulls on the podium was nice, so yeah. I mean, even when, when um, Checo made uh, Max pass him, Max, because they were close to traffic, Max actually gave um, Sergio DRS for a full lap on both the straights. And you can tell me what you want, but I mean, they said in qualifying, the, the DRS at Paul Ricard on the main straight and the back straight gains you seven tenths of a second. Yeah. And that definitely con contributed to Perez catching Valtteri that quick. Yeah. Definitely. So, just Perez, I, th I feel maybe not as, uh, as perfect a weekend as Max, but still a solid weekend from Sergio Perez. And I hope, finally, he is on pace with that Red Bull. I hope his pace doesn't, doesn't degrade again. But we'll have to see what happens. But I personally think Perez is finally where he needs to be in that Red Bull. Yeah, and I also think the win in Baku gave him that bit of a confident boost. Oh, most definitely. Yes, yeah, so just show you where there's confidence you could do way better like Bottas I don't think he has the confidence like Checo so that's, that's... basically the, what Bottas needs now is a dominant win over Verstappen and Hamilton mm -hmm. where he runs away with the race and it's just like where the hell did this come from uh, yeah but if the team doesn't support it it would just be back to square one well, if you look what, what Bottas did back in Spain, where he didn't want to let Lewis pass, if he just says, screw the team, you never know what might happen. That'll be a very juicy podcast, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we could maybe like be like, the team doesn't want him anyway, so just burn all the bridges. Ah. I mean, why not? Very true, very true. But let's get into the final topic about Red Bull, guys, and that is the Honda engine's straight line speed. Look, both Red Bulls and both Alpha Tauris this weekend had brand new power units. But they were leaps and bounds quicker than the Mercedes cars in the straights in practice, qualifying, and the race. Honda have worked wonders with that engine. To just give some of the new Formula One fans an idea, Three years ago, that was by far the slowest and most unreliable engine in Formula 1. Remember, you've got Mercedes, Ferrari, um, Renault, and the Honda power units. When Honda came back in, what was it, 2015, 2014, or 2015? I'm not exactly I think it was 2015. They had more than a 100 horsepower deficit, not just on the, on the normal petrol-powered engine, the internal combustion engine, but also on electrical power. They were, I mean, the famous team radio of Fernando Alonso, GP2 engine, GP2 engine, it was pathetic. And now it looks like it's the strongest engine on the grid. And it's been, what, just more than five years? That amount of engine development and consistency from Honda combined with Red Bull is fantastic. Yeah. And also, I think, when did, when did um, Red Bull move to Honda? Um, they moved to... No, 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 they moved to Honda Motors in 2020. So for 2020 and 2021, they had the Honda power units. Before that, McLaren um, and Alpha, well, they're back then, Toro Rosso were the, they were the test teams for the Honda power units. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, yeah, maybe the fact that Red Bull moved to Honda, I don't know how this works, but maybe there was a bit more like cash flow to develop because it is a high end team. I don't know how it works. So, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, Christian Horner, ever since Red Bull moved to the Honda Power Units, Christian Horner made it clear on multiple occasions throughout the seasons that Red Bull have been with Honda, well, Honda been with Red Bull, whatever, however you want to say it, they have been working non-stop with Honda to to develop a, a, that engine to where, the, to where it can compete with Mercedes. And look what's happening in 2021. Yeah. They are... If not, if they are not faster, they are at least on par with Mercedes. Yes. Especially when it comes to reliability. The Honda power unit was immensely unreliable. Neither one of the Alpha Tauris this year so far as I can remember. No, Sonoda had a problem in, in Spain. But that's the only one. Other than, than that, Red Bull haven't, well, Honda haven't had any engine failures this year. The Mercedes power units in Mercedes, Aston Martin, and Williams have had more issues. The Ferrari power units seem reliable, but then don't have as much power. And then the Alpines, they are just somewhere in the middle. <laughs> don't know exactly where the Renault motors are, but still, 
to that engine this weekend, the straight line speed of the Red Bulls was actually mind blowing. Yeah, uh, when uh, Val, not Valtteri, when Max catch up to Valtteri on that straight, that was yeah, the back straight. The back straight that that made me realize the power of the Honda engine. Uh, yeah, he had DRS and all of that, but he, if it when was, they started on the straight, he was seven tenths behind. I yeah, <laughs> so it was already. I can't speak tonight. <laughs> Guys, we'll just give Johnny a moment. And three, anyway. two, one, go. Okay. <laughs> um, on the track with the two straights, you can gain seven tenths, and he gained it in one straight. Yes with the RS but that is incorporated with the two back straights so I mean massive power <laughs> no 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 um, the, the Red Bull Mo uh, the Red Bull Motors the Honda engines have, have come a very very long way and for, m for me when Honda was still back in Formula 1 and I started for watching Formula 1 as a kid it's good to see them back in the sport and succeeding um, uh, so from me being a Japanese car fan um, I love to see the fact that there's a Japanese engine in Formula One doing well. So, um, freaking, I, I, I take my hat off to Red Bull and Honda who have developed that engine to where it is today. Now, the last topic. Uh, oh, sorry, Johnny, do you want to say something? I wanted to say something. Um, it just made me realize the to come back to Honda, the move that Red Bull made to Honda from Reynolds, I think, was a good move because there was already a Renault team mm. so there was always that competition they don't really want Red Bull to do better than the 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 team the factory team the factory team so I think that also gave um, Red Bull the freedom to develop a car oh no most definitely Champion winning car actually yep um, and also but also to look back at the Renault Red Bull saga Red Bull won all four of their world championships with Renault engines in the back of the cars back in 2010 to 2013. But that is basically a decade ago. So let's move on to the topic I least want to talk about. <laughs> okay, guys, my team, Ferrari got caught out by the tires. Very bad weekend from both cars. Now, obviously, Mattia Bonotto has stated, he basically stated directly after the race, the Ferrari this year, even though the car is much better than it was last year, it's still immensely hard on its tires. It struggles to preserve tires, the chassis itself. So it basically, it all depends on the drivers. And with this weekend's high tire degradation, like we, we talked about in the beginning of the podcast, <laughs> uh, even though it pays me to say, but Ferrari was just nowhere. Mm, yeah, it was actually sad to see them fall so fast behind. So, uh, yeah, I, I actually feel your pain. Mm. I mean, Monaco, Leclerc qualified on pole, Sainz qualified in P4, and if Leclerc didn't ha did actually started that race, I believe he would have won that race. Go to Azerbaijan, Leclerc qualifies on pole again, and do it does decently in the race. Not the race pace of Mercedes and Red Bull, but still has a decent performance. And we're heading into France, Carlos Sainz had an interview with a few of the commentators and he said they know this weekend going back to a more traditional style track, they're still gonna have that five, six tenths deficit towards Red Bull and Mercedes. But they still thought that they would be they would be ahead of McLaren. And Bob's your uncle. Charles Leclerc finishes P16 and Carlos Sainz in P11. But one thing I do do want to say, well done to Carlos Sainz for actually just missing out on points. He hang on to an absolute donkey of a car because Sainz complained, uh, was the, the driver that complained the most about wear on the hard tires. He started complaining on uh, after only 8 laps of running on the hard. That's how badly the, the Ferrari was wearing out its tires. Sure. Well, he did a flippin' absolutely great job to get that Ferrari in P11, almost at 10. And something that people do not know, Charles Leclerc entering the pit stop for his, for his, well, entering the pit lane for his second pit stop. As the team took the tire off the car, the car, the tire was starting to shred itself, the, the left rear. So it was basically, if Charles stayed out one more lap, he would have gotten a puncture. That's how badly the Ferrari was wearing its tires. So, obviously, 
I, uh, it pains me to say it, but this weekend Ferrari just, they have to sort something out with that chassis because they can't have this problem for the rest of the year. Because some of the tracks we're going to are also very high degradation tracks. And if they've got this problem, they're not going to sniff anything, any points. No. So Ferrari have got a lot of homework to do after this weekend in France. Anything you want to add to that topic, Johnny? Not really. <laughs> okay, not really. Guys, into the final two topics, and then we go into this week's driver ratings. You guys know I love him. You guys know I've got a weak spot. As soon as all the old guys are gone, Hamilton, Alonso, Raikkonen, all those guys, he will be the guy I'll be screaming for and dancing like a cheerleader with pom-poms. Pierre Gasly is an absolute animal. He had the best 2020 and basically 2021 came and he's just like okay let's keep going the momentum that pierre gasly is on is insane the alpha towery as far as i am concerned is not a top 10 is not a points winning car and he stuck with both the mclarens the entire race and we know on what absolute amazing pace norris and ricardo was and gasly was there the entire bloody time well that was that's something <laughs> you can you can look back on well he can look back on that race and be very proud of himself i think yeah most definitely and i mean even yuki sonoda who's i think really getting to grips with that car even though he had a bad mistake in qualifying he started in the pit lane and where did let me quickly check i think sonoda ended in uh science was p11 i think sonoda ended p12 let's quickly check here uh, no, Sonoda ended P13. He had a battle with Russell at the end of the race. But Sonoda, at the end of the first lap, was something like, I think it was 15 seconds behind the closest car. And come the end of the race, he was he was fighting close to points. Because Stroll, who was in P10, was just ahead of Sainz. Then, um, I just said his name for Pete's sakes. Um, not the point. Those four drivers were so close together, if there was a few more laps, Yuki could have gotten points. Yeah. So the two Alpha Tauri drivers are really starting. Well, Gasly has been on momentum still, but even Sonoda is starting to make that car work like it's supposed to work. And it's fantastic to see because besides Ferrari and McLaren, I've got a massive weakness for Alpha Tauri. I've always been a Toro Rosso fan before they went over to the name Alpha Tauri. I love the Toro Rosso team. I want them to do good. Oh, yes. Uh, it's well, this whole year they did really well. If well, on, on Gasly's side of the garage, okay, Yuki has Yuki. taken a while to get used to the yeah, car, but the car is there if both drivers show up. Yeah, definitely. But just we must remember Yuki, it's his first year in Formula 1. But yeah, he's a rookie. Doing that well in a car that's not really a top 10 finisher, I think it's, I think it's good. Yeah, no, no. I mean, there's the name. Sonoda, Russell, Sainz, and, um, and Stroll, they were literally nose to tail for the final few laps and I think literally on the final two laps Stroll and um, and, and Sainz started to pull away a bit from Russell and Sonoda but still fantastic weekend um, from Pierre Gasly he's an absolute animal and I'm so looking forward to what how, to what happens the rest of this year because France was his home race and he he showed up I'm sure the French fans are very proud unlike with Esteban Ocon who came in P14 but we don't talk about that um and guys, the final topic, which is basically, in my opinion, the elephant in the room. The entire F1 community knows if you've been watching F1 since 2018 or earlier. Paul Ricard has never been an exciting race. It's been an absolute ball fest. It's been the best time to take a Sunday nap after you've had a nice lunch with your, with your family. Not this year, however. <laughs> and I said it with the previous podcast that I had to do alone. Not the point. <laughs> I'm just making the motorsport live streamers feel a bit bad. Um, but I still love them. I said in that podcast, if there's any year where Paul Ricard can be a good and exciting race, it's this one. And look what happened. Look what an absolute spectacle we had at Paul Ricard, thanks to Hamilton, Verstappen, Red Bull and Mercedes, and the insanity of the midfield. Yeah, uh, well, I can't really comment much because it's my first Paul Ricard race I'm watching, so yeah, I think... Yeah, but 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 Johnny, let me ask you this: If you have to put, if you have to rank this race as an excitement level out of ten, what would you put it out of? What would you give it out of ten? Looking towards the the races we've had earlier this year already, which have been insane. We haven't had a boring race this year so far. <laughs> so, if you would rank this race from one to ten of how exciting it was, what would you give it? Well, definitely eight or nine. 
So, I mean. I mean, obviously, my favorite race of the year was still the season opener in Bahrain. I still think that was that's so far the race of the season, and then it's um, Azerbaijan. Um, that was because Azerbaijan was to me the most dramatic, but not the best race of the season. But this is definitely now in the conversation for our podcast at the end of the year where we're going to choose our race of the season oh, yeah. so this was a fantastic fantastic race in Paul Ricard and um, if the racing stays like this I've got no problem going back oh, to yes. Paul Ricard <laughs> definitely so hopefully the rest of the F1 community feels that way but guys that has been the topics for today now we're getting in towards the fun part of the podcast now driver ratings Johnny will you please do the first four drivers for me okay we start off with Haas Haas. Mazepin 3 out of 10 (laughs) Schumacher 4 out of 10 Latifi 4 out of 10 and Russell 6 out of 10 I'm not gonna lie. I actually gave Russell less than a than than, than a six, but um, I actually didn't realize he finished in P12 and that absolute donkey of a Williams. So I think overall for Russell a good weekend, and the other three Latifi, Schumacher, and Mazepin, yeah, I mean they just didn't show up this weekend. Um, so okay, into the next four drivers. First of all, the two Alfa Romeo boys, Giovinazzi and Raikkonen. Guys, Giovinazzi stellar weekend but also the Alfa Romeo struggled with pace so we gave Gio a 5 out of 10 and then I don't know why you guys gave Raikkonen such high points Raikkonen finished behind Mick Schumacher in P18 and, oh, I, I'm, sorry guys I, I bumped the mic with my chinny chinny chin chin um, but Raikkonen finished behind Schumacher and both the Williams I think I gave Kimi a 2 out of 10 but thanks to the other Motorsport Lounge members he's been upgraded to a 4 out of 10 um, then heading in towards the two Aston Martins. Brilliant strategy once again from Aston Martin and brilliant tire preservation from both Stroll and Vettel. Um, so I think well deserved 6 out of 10 for Lance Stroll and uh, the man Seb Sebastian Vettel. Once again, very good weekend from Seb. Qualifying throughout throughout practice, qualifying and the race. Um, a 7 out of 10 for Sebastian. Both Astons in the points at the end with 9th and 10th. So beautiful racing from them. Johnny, you have the two Alpines and the two Alpha Tauris. Okay, Ocon, 5 out of 10. Mm-hmm. Still too high. <laughs> Alonso, 6 out of 10. Yuki Sonoda, 5 out of 10. I feel he could have maybe got a bit more. I also think Yuki deserves more, but that's yeah. not my fault. There's 7 other members on the group. Yeah, that's true. And then Gasly, out of 8 out of 10. I personally feel Gasly deserves more after that absolute insane race and the an absolute insane momentum he's on. But I think if... Honestly, I think Gasly would have gotten a 10 or an 11 if he ended in in front of the two McLarens. Okay. So there is still margin for him to gain points, but beautiful weekend from PA Gasly. Beautiful weekend from Alpha Tauri in general. And um, yeah, Alpine just... I can't believe you guys gave Alonso a 6 out of 10. And yes, I ranted on the group about this, but I'm going to rant about it again. So all of the Motorsport Lounge members, listen up. <laughs> How the hell did you guys give him a 6 out of 10? I actually still need to go watch the WTF1 podcast because I want to see what they rate him as. But I think they said an A. I know they rate they rated A plus and A B C D. Yeah, yeah. And they gave them gave them A. So. so what's wrong with you guys? Alonso had one of the worst cars of the weekend, and he ended just behind Gasly and P8. I, I I'm not gonna ask for the explanation, guys. But basically, Alonso deserved at least a seven, and they gave him a six. Some of the members on the motorsport lounge gave him a five out of ten, which I want to kick in the nuts. Not the point. Um. So me personally, and this is not because Alonso is my hero. This is because I. I honestly believe he deserves it. This is from a neutral perspective. I believe Alonso de- deserved at least a 7. If it was up to me, I would have given him an 8. Not the point. Um, heading in towards basically the team of the weekend. Um, uh, McLaren and the two Ferraris. Um, obviously, Daniel Ricciardo and Lando Norris had, ex- had both had an exceptional weekend. McLaren had a fantastic weekend in Paul Ricard. So both... Um, Lando and Daniel will get a 9 out of 10 and then into (laughs) the embarrassing team of the weekend Um, Carlos Sainz gets a 5 out of 10 and Charles Leclerc which honestly even though I I love Leclerc I don't feel he deserves a 4 out of 10 I feel he deserves like a 2 out of 10 for finishing in P16 but obviously out of their control with the Ferrari's high tire wear Leclerc gets a 4 out of 10 and Johnny you've got the final two teams that basically has been the biggest talking point of this podcast very true okay Bottas 
8 out of 10 Hamilton, 8 out of 10 Paris, 9 out of 10. I, I think he could have got a 10 out of 10, but let's just leave it there. And then Verstappen, 11 out of 10, of yeah, course. Yeah, obviously, guys, Verstappen was the driver to beat this weekend, and he gets the little crown on top of his points. He gets an 11 out of 10. Now, heading in towards the con our own created constructors championship after round six the standings were actually johnny you can take the standings after the previous round in azerbaijan and then i'll do the standings after this round in france all right so williams was in p10 with it's Haas in p10 sorry i can't read <laughs> it's because all the, the the script on your cell phone is so freaking tiny you need a magnifying glass to read it sorry <laughs> okay so Haas on he was in P10, Williams, 9, Alfa Romeo. You need to read the points as well. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Let's just make it a longer podcast. <laughs> okay, Haas, P10 with 46 points, Williams with 63, Alfa, Alfa Romeo. Let me just say it right before I get a hit from here. Anyway. <laughs> I'm the one who's going to do anything. <laughs> 76. Mercedes with 77, Alpha Tari with 79, Aston Martin with 80 points, Alpine with 83, McLaren with 92, Ferrari with 100 points, and Red Bull with 107. Okay, guys, so that was the standings after round six um, in Azerbaijan, and now heading towards the standings after this weekend at Paul Ricard. Haas are still in P10 on 53 points. P9 is Williams on 73. The gap between 9th and 10th is massive. Haas is really having a bad season. In eighth place, we've got Alfa Romeo on 85. Mercedes are no longer in P7. It is now occupied by Alfa Tauri on 92 points. Then tied in 5th position is Aston Martin and Mercedes on a 93 points. Alpine still maintain P4 on 94 points. Ferrari have however moved down to P3 behind McLaren and they are, are on 109 points. McLaren are occupying P2 with 110 points so still very close. And at this stage Red Bull is are, are starting to run away in the lead with 127 points. Now heading in towards my favorite section of the podcast the 2021 french grand prix predictions i think we'll do two two so i'll do myself and boost it first and johnny you can do yourself and demi so guys this is the points ratings ocon absolutely was pathetic this weekend with all due respect and i said a ferrari top six which i shot myself in the foot with so i only gained five points to my little points tally then boosted said a verstappen win which is true um that's five points he said leclerc top five <clears throat> not happening which is sad and then he said an alonso top 10 which got him his second five points so boosted takes home a full 10 points next is demi thank you johnny awesome okay so demi first prediction was max win of course then bottas podium unfortunately not I, I'm saying unfortunately because that was my prediction as well, but I'm actually happy. <laughs> but I'm actually happy. Anyway, Bottas podium, didn't got that. And then Stroll finishes on inside the top 10. Where did he finish actually? In P10 for one championship point. Just made it. And that gave her 10 points. Then my prediction, Red Bull top 5. Both of the Red Bulls was on top 5. That's an easy 5 <laughs> points. Freaking hell. I need to be competitive here. <laughs> Anyway, then Leclerc, top five. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> wait. Yeah, that didn't happen. And then Max Paul in quali. Which you did get because Max I qualified get. first. I was, that was my bold prediction actually. And then it actually happened. So that was, that was good. So Johnny, you take home 10 points. Heading in towards Milani and Jess. Milani's first prediction was a Ferrari top six. She's my fellow Ferrari fan. We were very sad this weekend and cried together. Then she said a Verstappen podium. He won, so that's on the top step of the podium. That's five points. And she said a Mercedes top four, which was also true. So Milani also takes home 10 points. Jess said 
Perez joins Verstappen and Hamilton uh, with the battle in the front, which he, he didn't do exactly. He wasn't fighting with Lewis and, and Max for the win. So unfortunately, I couldn't give her her 10 points for that. But Perez did support Max very good throughout that race. And uh, hopefully, pretty soon, he will be in that fight. Then she said Sainz beats Leclerc, which gives her uh, first five points because Sainz was the Ferrari leader this weekend, in my opinion. And then she said Vettel top eight finish, which she missed out with one position because Vettel got P9. So Jess almost takes home 10 points, but unfortunately it's only five due to per Sainz beating Leclerc. Johnny, you've got the final two. What's that? Gay. Yanku. Yes. Okay, no English. You pronounce pronounce. that for, uh, properly. It's English, okay. Afrikaans, Yanku, Yanku, Okay, Yanku, cool. Yanku Verstappen wins. He's first and only five points, unfortunately. <laughs> Vettel top five. And that was a very bold prediction. Yeah, and safety car in the first 20 laps. I don't know, Paul Ricard, but I don't think it's possible for a safety car. No, literally all the two races we had before this year, there was a safety car in the first 20 laps. So that uh, was a, a fair prediction to go for. But unfortunately, this year they all kept it nice and clean. Mm -hmm. There was a massive crash actually back in 2019 between Ocon and Gasly. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so it's possible. Anyway, um, I, I, I think it's the first race where there wasn't a safety car or something like that. I will have to go double check that, but I think you are correct that this was the first race without a safety car, but we'll go check that. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 Monaco didn't have a safety car. Oh, yeah, Monaco. So it's the second race. Okay, it's the second race. Okay, cool. Anyway, forget about that. <laughs> okay, Jerry Pye said, first up in top three. I think everyone who, say, who says... Say? Who says you were correct at Okay, one. who say, says that... <laughs> Verstappen top three is isn't really a bolt. Yeah, that's that's really. like that's like that's like penny points. It's like okay, give me my five points. Yeah, and then Vettel top five. We all wasn't the no, Vettel. No, it's Norris top five. Vettel top seven. <laughs> my brain. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Okay, guys. Norris top five, which she got. She she got, and then Vettel top seven. Yeah, also very close. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay, okay but that gives her, her 10 points. So guys, the T, the T Motorsport Lounge Predictions Championship, I finally found a name for it. Um, the standings after the previous round in Azerbaijan, obviously remember Yanku and JDP were not yet part of this for that. So for that one, Milani was in P6 with 15 points. Jess and Demi shared P4 because they were tied on 20 points. Uh, myself and Johnny were in P2, tied on 25 points, and Boosted was leading the way on 30 points. Now the standings after round 7 at Paul Ricard, Yanku is occupying P8 on 5 points, JD Pai in P7 on 10 points, Milani and Jess are sharing 5th place, tied on 25 points, then myself and Demi are sharing 3rd position on 30 points, Johnny is now in P2 on 35 points, and Boosted is still maintaining P1 with his 40 points, we're gonna have to do something about that Johnny. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so Johnny, for this final part, the 2021 Styrian Grand Prix predictions, you can do the first four, so it's myself, Booster, Demi, and Jess, and I'll do the final four, and then we can say our goodbyes. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so you said Ferrari bounces back. They bloody better. I think that's a bold, bold prediction. Don't make my situation more sad than it already is, Jonathan. Thank you very much. <laughs> wow, my full name. Thanks about that. <laughs> anyway, um, then secondly, uh, Alonso top eight, and then Bottas beat Hamilton. Yeah, that's my boldest one. Okay. <laughs> okay, boosted. Uh, Perez podium. Okay, Norris top four and Vettel top eight. Quickly, can I just quickly say something about Norris top four? I hope Boosted realizes that that means Norris needs to beat either a Red Bull or a Mercedes. Oh. So that's a very bold mm, prediction that, from that Boosted. That is actually a very bold prediction. So yes, and the other one is Vettel top eight. Vettel top eight, yes. And then Demi, Verstappen on no top three finish. So she says Verstappen is not going to be on the podium. podium. Okay. Jonathan just no, shed his little tear. No comment about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ferrari top 10 and then Gio Fanazzi on top... In the top 13. In the top 13. Sorry, I'm just helping you. Yeah, thank you. And then your, your beautiful sister's uh, predictions? First happen again. 
top 3 and then Perry's top 10 and Vettel top 10. I think this is a very, there's not really bold predictions there, but... So guys, basically what we're saying is I, Jess might be the first motorsport and lounge member to get a full 16 points because that's very possible with those predictions. So Johnny, you said Verstappen wins. It's the first time in a while you've said that, so yeah, because, I'll give you that one. Because I wasn't allowed to a few rounds ago, but anyway. If you guys recall the previous podcast, I think he said it like five times in a row, so I... I five times! Okay, seven. It's not the point. <laughs> We're only on round seven. Not the point, guys. I just have a little rule in the motorsport lounge. You can't use the same prediction three times in a row. So you've got your, your two times, and then you need to change it. Um, so you said for your first one, Verstappen wins. Second one, Lando top five again. Uh, well, for the second week in a row, Lando to get a top five. And you said Ricardo top seven. So you are fully on the Red Bull and McLaren hype train. Yep. Then Janku said for Stappen podium, very possible. Well, Janku and Demi's prediction. Days for Stappen wins or podium is against Demi's. So. Also true. I don't know what I. I think Demi might have found a little bit of a slip in for Stappen. We'll talk to her. We'll we'll, we'll have a hard talk with her. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Yanku's second prediction is a Ricardo top 10 and his third one is a Perez top 5. You guys are really going for frippin' freaking easy points this this time. I'm gonna have to do a, a I think a challenge where I say for the next race everybody three bold predictions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Not the point because I I, well, I <laughs> actually now that we Yanku and Jaddy Poi isn't in this battle for long, so maybe they are allowed to go for easy points for like the next rounds yeah. to catch up, but the rest of us must maybe do bold predictions next. Uh, it's, it's, Just it's, to make it a bit fair, maybe. It's your choice. I don't know. You actually got a good point there. I think as soon as everybody is on similar points, then we go crazy. Mm. Not the point. Okay, then Milani said for step and wins, even though I spelled like my bum, I said for step winner. <laughs> so um, for step and wins. Um, Ferrari top 10 please and her third prediction is a Perez top 5 a lot of people predicting something with Perez yeah. and then JD Pye the final one for this prediction is she also said Verstappen wins both Red Bulls in the top 3 so that's she wants both on the podium and Norris top 7 her secret crush so <laughs> guys that has been the podcast for this um, French Grand Prix now, before we leave you guys, Johnny, your final thoughts heading into racing again this weekend in Austria for the Styrian Grand Prix. I hope that Red Bull's um, bad luck on their home track, track. home track doesn't catch them this weekend. That's coming. Well, we'll be, we're there for two weeks in a row because it's, it's Styria this week and next week it's Austria. So it's the same track, just different names due to contract issues with the FIA and Formula One. Not the point. But honestly, my final, my final um, thoughts are I hope we see a little bit of a McLaren or a Ferrari or an Alpha Tauri surprise podium in one of the two weekends but specifically for Styria because there's, there's a big chance of rain on Sunday I hope to see only one of the top two teams on the podium meaning one Mercedes or one Red Bull not both so I'm just hoping for an absolute insane race like we had there last year with the season op the, the, the two season opening races so I'm just hoping for absolute insanity uh, because Austria provides that at a very good level but guys, that has been the podcast. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for staying till the end. This is a long one. So <laughs> uh, make sure to drop a like down below. It's probably going to be split in two. So make sure to, to like both podcasts. Well, both part one and part two. Make sure to go check out the links in the description down below. And if this is your first time visiting Turbo Fox Races, don't hesitate to hit that, sub that subscribe down below. And don't forget to ding that bell to never miss a future awesome video here on Turbo Fox Races. Johnny, say your goodbyes. Bye-bye. Guys, I'll see y'all for the next video. Love you guys. Cheers!